Okay, sorry. Uh, good afternoon to, uh, to all. Uh, happy to see you again. As Sri Priya said, uh, today we are going to learn about uh, communication skills, uh, part one. Uh, that, that is on basic communication skills. Uh, we all know that uh, without communications, we can't maintain a, a good relationship uh, with everyone, especially uh, with the patients. We need a, we need to maintain a good relationship with the patients. So next relationship, uh, patient relationship is the uh, important one while doing the uh, patient care. So today we have uh, Ms. Preeti with us. Uh, she is uh, she is our uh, social officer. Uh, she did her uh, MSW uh, in uh, counseling specialization, and she has uh, 16 years of experience uh, in teaching. Uh, now she is working here as a uh, social officer. Uh, welcome, ma'am, and over to you. Good morning to all. I hope you are all fine in the afternoon at this time. So let's start the session. Let me start sharing the screen. So today's session is on communication and palliative care. The topic I am given is communication and palliative care. So let's continue. So the objective of the session is to learn what is communication, need of communication, positive body languages, barriers to effective communication, steps to effective communication, uh, what are the uh, don'ts and do's of poor communication and lis listening skill for a good communication. These are all what we are going to look into in this session. So communication is a therapeutic tool in palliative care. In situation of serious illness, communication is one of the most important tools which yeah. healthcare professionals use in giving the patient the information that they need to know before taking the situation into, in practice. So communication is needed in all, uh, in all the palliative situation, wherever we go for home care or an IP or, or if it is an outpatient also, we have to have a good communication with our patient uh, to reach the, uh, in, to know the, to get the information that need before taking the final dis final. So, so what is communication? Can anyone tell? Do anybody have an idea what is communication? I'm exchanging information with each other. Okay, thank you, Deep. Hello. Hello, Umi. What are you saying? Anybody else? So communication can be what? It can be anywhere. Where, when, how, why, with whom. It's all according to the situation we are. Communication is an art of transmitting ideas, thoughts, information, and attitudes from person to another. Communication is a meaningful interaction among human beings, two persons, two with our friends, with whoever uh, is close to us, whoever is uh, a close friend, we, we communicate very freely with them. Like that interaction among who all do we interact with to have a communication, like friends, family members, anybody else Any, uh, that you think that we will interact to have a good communication? Anybody can 
if you uh, are not confident to speak, you can type it in the chat box. Okay, so we we can't we cannot not communicate. So we are all the time communicating something to people. Yes, Salomi, you are communicating always with whoever is around us, isn't it? Thank you, sir. So communication and communication is an important tool in the palliative care as well to the patients, families, everything. The patient may be having a long-term illness or suffering from a long-term illness or from uh, some uh, unexpected traumatic uh, accidents or something. So while we meet a patient, we have to have a good communication. Patient and their families, we have to have a good communication. They may be uncertainty, fear, anguish, sorrow, Many things must be going around in a patient and family's mind and a palliative care team or a social worker who visits the patient and the family has to clarify. If we don't have a good communication with them, we, we can't clarify the issues, acknowledge us, understand their suffering. If they don't open up or they are not, we have not built a rapport with them, in the first place. So communication in palliative care is a very important tool. So these are some, these are uh, something for an empathetic communication with our pa patients. So palliative care is to provide compassionate approach towards elevation of suffering and long-term illness. So we have to spend advocate time with patients and and uh, and families if we uh, if we are there for only a short visit we are not spending time advocate enough to know more about their information or it will not be a uh, helpful because patients only open up after they we spend uh, some time and we build a rapport with them and the second one is for listen for feelings behind words that is while talking, they will be saying they are fine, they will be, they have no problems, but some of their nonverbal cues can give us some clues that they are not fine, that they are suffering from some uh, anxiousness, uh, like squeezing their hands, tapping in with their uh, clapping their hands. Uh, or tapping on their uh, different uh, on their hands or something, keeping their legs apart, that are verbal clues for us to understand that the patient must be suffering from some anxiousness, sorrow, like that. The next, the next thing is being accessible where you can be reached and when a pa a patient should know where we can be after contacting them where we can be reached when they need us. That is the time our, we should let them know when uh, we are accessible, like the time we will be available for them. And they should also know when we are not available, that we have some, uh, if like, the, uh, like say seven days in a week, if we are not available in Sunday, that should be known to the patient and to whom they should contact in case of emergency. And the next thing is maintaining confidentiality. That's an important thing among a communication because a patient may open up very easily to us uh, in their sadness when they are confident enough to open up, they will be opening up to us their personal problems, their issues, everything. But a social worker, a nurse, or a doctor, whoever, or the team that, uh, the medical team that sees the patient should maintain a confidentiality that they won't say it to another person. If there are some cases that we have to open up to others because there must be some, uh, some cases that we can find it that the, person, the patient will be suffering from some suicidal tendency or a 
suicidal tendency or they may be going to harm somebody else in that case we should open up to our team and tell the others also and discuss among our uh, medical team to reach a conclusion and to do the necessary follow up then if we give uh, if we tell a patient that we are going to visit them or to see the uh, coming to see them we should keep that up keep that appointments we should not break that appointment because they must be eagerly waiting for our visit a palliative care system they eagerly wait our visits for each appointments because once in a month when we visit them they are happily welcoming us to so at no cost only in emergency cases we should we should uh, uh, not as much as possible we should not uh, not keep any appointments uh, we should not keep the appointments um, sorry keep the appointments as much as possible don't break it then another thing is ops Uh, observe surroundings in patients home can anybody say why is it important to observe surroundings in a patient home anyone so the seeing the surrounding if it is clean or very dirty Uh, if it's a chaos or if it's tidy, it shows also how the family and the surrounding functions. Mm -hmm. If they need maybe support in in keeping the household, or the, if they are, they seem to cope uh, quite well. So the, this gives some signs. True. Thank you, Shalomi. That's true. We should the um, we. if they have kept a clean house if water is available in the house all can be observed what can we gather what can we gather from these observations anyone else observe surroundings in patients so what can we gather from these observations it will reveal the socio economic condition of the family and the patient very true correct mahima isn't it mahima thank you. thank you that's very true we can assess the socio economic status of the family also and if there is any problem or whatever they are suffering from if the patient is not in a comfortable position if the patient doesn't have any bathroom that is at a, if it's a paraplegic or a traumatic para, uh, that is a stroke patient or something we can assess uh, whether we have to provide some helping hand to the to such patients too. so it's better when we have a visit to observe the surroundings in a in a patient's home next is encourage and reassure while maintaining realistic hope <laughs> realistic hope or perspective means go no untruthful hope or expectation should be given to a patient so we shouldn't give any hope that is not truthful that that will give a hope to the patient that uh, that uh, my illness will be reduced or my pain uh, even if there is a pain or a long term illness the giving hope to the patient of living a long life or something like that unrealistic hope should not be given to the patients it's a situation we 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 are in if we are giving an uh, a hope to the patient that's not truthful it's because we ourselves are in a position in a discomfortable position in the sit situation we so in that situation we have to break it into small goals so that we can solve each problem one by one so that the patient will be in a comfortable position or they should be told the truthful condition of how what they are suffering from or relieve their or 
to relieve their pain what should be done like that they should be given a hope of a truthful so uh, a realistic hope should be given to the patient and then uh, the next one is provide information as and when needed so that is if a patient is need uh, is asking us any information as to how uh, what is uh, this medicine for why is this medicine given for such a such a interval some painkillers are given for Two, four hours gap. Why it is given? What should we? Why are we giving, taking so much medicines? Will there not be any after effects or a, uh, in taking so much medicine? So provide information, whatever is needed to the patient as and when needed, clearly. As we know, we shouldn't. Uh, if we don't know the thing uh, to tell the true information clearly, we will. We have to inquire and tell them, but don't give a false information to any patients. So that is. So why communication is important for pa patients? It helps to express his or her needs or concerns. So while we are talking or we are building a rapport to, with the patients, they are opening up. They are telling the, us to their concerns, what are their pains, what are they suffering from. So what, what all the, a patient, their family, not even a patient, the family members are also oh, uh, expressing their concerns to us, expressing their needs, what, how the patient is suffering from, what, what is the present condition of the patient. All these are expressed in a, while we are talking to the patient. Then it uh, while communicating, they ventilate their feelings. Some of the patients after long terms of illness will be lying down without meeting anybody. They must be seeing only the family members of the family members inside one room. They must, so they are ventilating their feelings. They, they will let out their sorrows, their uh, whatever they have inside them. Uh, they have suppressed inside, they will, the communication with the patients helps to ventilate the feelings, helps to clarify doubt and baseless apprehensions. There must be many doubts and apprehensions of where to go, which hospital they have to take treatment, what treatment has to be taken in the future, what, is, uh, what should be done at this situation, the patient, the family members, the caregiver, all must have many, many doubts when a team approaches a nurse or a social worker or a doctor, or even the whole team goes for a home visit. They have many doubts, which some may be baseless, but we have to hear them and clarify the doubts what the patient is giving, give reassurance and realistic hope. This I have explained earlier also that we shouldn't give any unwanted hopes to the patient, but it should be reassurance uh, that we are with them at the time of their needs and that it's no unwanted hope should be given to a patient. Give the fam patient and family a sense of direction. The patient and family should be directed towards the right path that they what all are needed in the future what should, type of treatment they should take what are the medicines they should be given it all should be given in the right time to the patients and the family members help guide them in decision making process and some cases they may they may be reluctant to continue their treatment there may be socioeconomic situation where they are not able to continue their treatment or to meet or go to hospital for further review checkups like that. There may be many. So we have to guide them in decision-making process of how to, which doctor or to help them review a doctor or to, uh, or what to do in that situation. Assisting for coping, coping with bad news. If the patient is in a bad condition, if they 
if the doctor or the nurse who is going understands that the patient is in, in going into a bad situation or a EOL, we have to assess the, we have to break the news. We have to communicate with the uh, family of how to cope with the bad news. This is for us, the social workers or the nurse or that we, when we go and meet a patient, we should have a good relationship. That is a good rapport should be built with the family and the patient as well. Then we will have less stress and we will have, have built a trust with a good trusting trust with the patient. A good rapport building is needed for that. We need communication better understand the impact of illness and quality of life. We should understand the what all are the, uh, what all illness the patient is suffering from and the impact that will affect them in their future life so that we, can, we will give them a quality of service to the patient. Understand patient's thought process. We have to talk to them. We have to understand their feelings what they are going through, what the th thought process is, what, what they are suffering from at that moment to give the patient a good, if there is no good communication with the patient, we can't help the patient through a good thought process. Understand patient's beliefs, values, concerns, and priorities. We have, by talking to them, we can understand that every person is unique. They may have their own beliefs, or different va values, concerns. Every patient will not be having the same concern or priorities. Each pr patient's priorities or concerns or their problems will be different and their beliefs will be also different. So we have to understand that and talk to them or communicate with them accordingly. Provide required information and diagnosis and prognosis. So we have to have a good knowledge about the diagnosis and prognosis of each patient. Better compliance with management. For us to work better, we should have a better compliance, a better relationship with the workplace too. So this is a graph of what is the elements of personal communication. So what do you understand from this slide you are seeing? Anybody? Anyone? Okay. So the major part of any communication is body language according to the graph. It's 55% of the communications, uh, personal communications comes through body language, 38% is through voice tone, and 7% is through spoken words. So most through uh, the patient's body language, our body language, all communicate a lot, a lot. That is what this graph is. Sure. So some of the positive body languages are eye contact, facial expression, tone of voice, body position, body posture, body space, and touch. Anyone has any anything to say about it? Till now, what we have learned. If any, anything, any clarification, you can put it in the chat box also. Okay. So the next thing is tips for making eye contact. So when we'll... We should do it when we are going to meet a patient. Making eye contact, when you look, do it slowly. Don't look down when you look. So 
when a patient is looking at, uh, the next thing is don't look down when a patient is looking down at you looking at you when you look down it means the patient we are losing con contact with the patient and they will we will uh, a rapport building will be lost among them rather than looking away look at another spot on their face so if you are not comfortable enough to look at, directly into their eyes it's but you can look at another spot on their face but not direct into their eyes break your gaze to make a gesture or to note while communicating you can break your eye contacts only to make a gesture that you are listening or hearing what they are saying by nodding a nodding is also a good gesture that you are listening to them so make eye contact before you start talking to someone that is the first body language we have to understand the next thing is a facial expression what can you see in these pictures so there are different facial expressions that see yes rekha and there are different types of facial expression mm. like laughing nodding alas they are using the yeah like crying laughing angry faces there so these are different facial expressions but can we go in these different facial expressions to a patient no we should have a smiling facial expression then the next thing is the tone of voice we should have a melodious or a warm tone while we are talking to a patient can we say in a hoarse angry can we talk with our patients in a uh, angry hoarse tone like hello or is it hello hi how, how are you so what do you say about it about a tone of voice it should be a melodious warm tone Yes, Rekha. It should be a melodious warm. Yes, there should be a warmth in a tone. <laughs> so the do's and do do's in in this tone of voice and eyes is make eye contact, smile. But nowadays we are behind the mask, so smile behind the mask, smile with your voice. there is a quote that a smile can be seen in your eyes a smile can be seen heard in your voice also because even without seeing what is expression under the mask the eyes also express a uh, communicate with others that you are smiling from behind the mask your voice will also be tell if it is a warm or a melodious or a soft voice it will be saying that you are smiling behind the mask you have a smile that is a friendly warm smile uh, that is the starting of a good relationship with a pa patient but the dose is avoiding eye contact grumpy or stern voice irritated tone of voice that is if we while the patient is doing if we show a irritated tone that we are not interested then the the rapo or the contact we are going to make the communication we will we are going to make with the patient will be affected look at this uh, pictures what what do you understand from it the first picture you can see that the nurse is close stand standing closer to the patient is it the right position is it a right body position the nurse is maybe is in, will be in a comfortable patient the pa comfortable position but the patient is not in a comfortable position because the patient has turned his head towards the nurse 
and the patient is straining his head towards the nurse. The most comfortable position for communication at this at this picture is that the nurse should be at the foot of the bed, nearer to the foot of the bed so that the patient will have direct eye contact and can talk comfortably with the patient. Well, the second picture, it's a good communicating skill because the position of the doctor, the, the person who is with him and the patient is on direct eye contact so that they will have a comfort. The patient is also comfortable. The doctor is comfortably sitting and they are talking comfortably. There is a good communication between the doctor, patient and in this second picture. What about the third picture? It's a small child. If the doctor is standing and talking, that means the child has to look up at the doctor to have an eye contact or listen to him. Instead of that, the doctor has kneeled down so that he will have an eye contact with the child and talk, communicate with her properly. Or in another situation, the doctor can sit on a low chair and talk with the child so that he can have a good communication. What do you understand from this two? This is body posture. This is also very important in our communication. There is two different ways in the picture. Anyone have any comments? Anything to say? Second is correct. Ekha, yes, you are. Yes, one second board. No, ah, second is a good posture. Second right? one is. Yes, Rekha, correct. The second one is a good posture. Somebody has posted in the chat box also that the second position is the right one. So the first position, if he, if he sits with his legs up, do we feel like communicating with him properly? No, ma'am. Ah, no. So the second position, she is sitting with us with a spine straight and a leaning position, leaning forward position. So they are having a good communication between each other. So that's it with direct eye contact. That is what. So a good body posture can also be a good thing, good good in communication. Look, leaning forward. In the first picture, even though the lady is not having, maybe she may be having a, some problem or something to tell, but the doctor is leaning forward to talk to the patient so that he can have a good rapport with the pa patient. The second one, they both are having a good rapport and they are communicating very easily, very openly. This is another important thing in communication that is respecting our body space. There are main, there is intimate, you, by looking at the picture itself, you can understand. In the middle, there is intimate space, then is personal space, social space, and public space. Every person have an intimate space which they don't allow anybody else, only close persons or close relation or family members to be to enter uh, access that space. But public space is a, like a common area, like, like a lift, a public transport. Many may be uh, unknown to us, many different types of people may be there, but we may feel discomfort, but we adjust in that situation. But in palliative care, in some situations, we have to enter into their personal space as well as intimate space for some for checking their blood pressure blood sugar for some procedures the nurse or the have to in that situation it's very important that we communicate clearly with the patient that we are going to do so we are going to check the blood pressure or the blood sugar, and we are going to poke, uh, give a 
for prick with the needle so that we can take blood from for testing or if we are doing any procedures we have to clearly explain to them what we are doing and while the procedure is also going on we have to clearly say what we are doing and tell the patient clearly so that the patient will be relieved from their stress and will have a comfortable comfortable feeling otherwise we they will think that we we are intruding into their intimate or personal space touch is the most powerful therapeutic tool in communication do anybody have, uh, have any feeling seeing that picture anything to say Ma'am, we can touch by professional touch. We yeah. have to touch patient with a professional touch. True, true, Rita. So it is a touch in. We can't touch any like there is intimate by what we were talking about, but a uh, loving, warm touch in the hand on the shoulder. all can elevate the lonely suffering of a patient or as shown in the picture works wonders will enhance a positive vibe or a satisfaction on the patient we they will be a rapport building a uh, supporting loving touch will help a lot of change in a can bring a lot of change in a patient so core principles of communications are respect that that is each individual is unique and that we should respect the uniqueness of each each individual empathy empathy means standing understanding the person's feeling by placing ourselves in their position so that we can understand what they are going through trust be truth, truthful to the patient or to the family unconditional positive regard don't be judgmental consider patients as a person don't jump into any conclusion that so so and so patient is such a thing or like that so you should be unconditional there should be unconditional positive regard in that is the core principles of communication so barriers to effective communication there are some barriers to effective communication so what are the environmental barriers lack of privacy look at the picture the doctor is there the patient is there some other persons are sitting closer nearby will a patient open up in this, such situation to tell their problems no ma'am yes yes ma'am then a far, there should be a comfortable furnitures also furnitures can also be a, like a big table between the doctor and the patient or the nurse if the nurse is uh, nurse uh, the fun uh, the the chairs uh, are in two different uh, in a long gap then there will not be a good there will be environmental barriers for communication noise distraction lots of noise everybody talking together in the room lot of persons it's a crowded room these all are environmental barriers in communication look this is a fun like there will be distractions noise interruptions like phone calls diversions confusion so all in all these situations they won't be they can't they will not there will not be a good communications barriers related to patients there will be reluctance reluctance to disclose concerns some patients won't tell the tell about their sufferings or their problems very easily they will be reluctant they will keep it to themselves if we only after building a good rapport they will be able to disclose themselves lack of privacy if they, 
if they if they are not able to talk openly in a private space they will not open up they, that's also a barrier we will face among the patient fear of confirmation of bad news that if we the patient will be thinking that we are going to open up uh, to tell them some bad news or fear uh, that they are going to hear something bad they will not open up fear of treatment being denied if they raise questions or doubts a patient will not op uh, open up in the in the case that they have any questions or doubts and if they raise doubts or questions they will think that the, the nurses or the doctors will deny treatment or they will not be able to able to get a good treatment so they won't uh, raise any questions or doubts fear of loss in control over emotions they they will think that they may be having sorrows they may be in distress but if they open up if they start talking they will lo lose their control and they will start crying or they will express their uh, in innermost emotions so they will they will not open up they will the communication will be incomplete with such patients stumped by med 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 speech it means we can't use technical terms or medical jargons that will create barriers <coughs> among the patients some patients can understand signed uh, the medical terms like Uh, uh what is a cv or a traumatic paraplegia if we talk to them like that we they won't understand some of the medical jargon so we should avoid medical jargons or medical terms while communicating to a patient we as a barrier as a nurse or a doctor or a social worker we have barriers among us that's concentrating only on physical task <laughs> some of us, some of us will only look at the physical problems of the patient not on any other problems a patient may be having many problems can socio economic it can be spiritual it can be so lots of problems they can but if we are concentrating only on the physical task there is a barrier among our patient and the and among ourselves making assumptions judgments if before going itself we make a judgment that so and so patient is so that she is a cancer patient or she is very she is a, a angry person that she will talk so loudly don't make assumptions or judgments like that lack of training or experience knowledge and skill there may be lack of experience knowledge and skill will also uh, create barriers in communication our appearance facial expressions were these are also barriers in communication with our patients worried about being blamed or fear of worsening the situation we ourselves must be, may be tensed or worried about some something in our mind that we will be blamed or fear of if we tell something the situation the condition of the patient will worsen in that situation also there is a barrier of communication with a patient unfamiliar with the language and dialect we should talk in the language the patient can understand if the if we talk in one language and the patient is not understanding there is a barrier in communication so we should talk with the patient in the language the patient can understand so uh, the next topic is distancing tactics the first one is categorizing or labeling we shouldn't label or categorize a patient that she is a breast cancer patient he is a difficult patient he, like i told he is a an angry person or we will have problems while talking to him so no categorizing or labeling should be done ahead paying selective attention to say physical as aspects we should have attention to all the physical aspects doctor i am so, the patient is saying doctor i am so worried i can't sleep properly i also have pain in the back 
tell me about the play we should listen carefully and answer and uh, give the patient a detailed reply or a communicate with the patient never inquiring about the physical how are you feeling how have you been coping we should never inquire such physical matters using your pain is better isn't it in that thing the answer will be will be in one word or in a short form like no yes yes my pain is better but can we but don't use a you close to question like do you have pain now but instead use a open question always while communicating premature normalization don't worry anybody in your position will say feel the same so we shouldn't declare earlier itself that you everybody is feeling the same that your pain is like, compare with other persons that so and so is like this they are also feeling the same don't compare with anybody don't that you listen to them carefully understand their problems and we should have we should help them to reach a goal steps to effective communication we should have a good rapport building with the patient an open discussion that is we should understand the patient we should gather all information about the patient understand the patient's perspective what they are going through what they what is in their mind what they what goals they are looking forward through us these are all gathered while we are communicating with the patient share information arrive at agreement on problems and plans we should talk with them arrive uh, agree on what problems they are facing through what are the plans in future they how to uh, improve their conditions in life these are all understood when we have an open communication a good communication with them close discussion sensitively don't stop a uh, communication with a patient on a on a sudden manner we should have we should spend some time we should know them we should have a open talk and only then we should slowly stop the communi stop the communication at the right time so now we will see a video about communication so now we are going to see a video on good communication and bad communication watch the video and you can tell after watching the video you can let us know what you felt in after seeing the video a health worker that was uh, busy with phone twice she attended the phone call when she was uh, about to attend the patient yes true very true and she directly asks about the uh, pain yeah it was a leading question okay there is no eye contact between patient and health worker yes yeah true and she is not angry yes no sir this talking so angrily this is not talking calmly ah uh, calmly there's no warmth or a, a, or a softness in her voice okay sunda so in chat she was in hurry and uh, didn't talk much the patient not even as yes well. vishaka she was in a hurry and didn't talk much to patients not even assured him true the she was in a 
that's also very true nurse was not paying attention she was using her phone very true she was very busy talking to her she did not make any bad communication she she rushed her patient true these are all true uh, true comments from you that these are some of the uh, problems we are uh, when we have to see a patient what we have when how we can communicate have a good communication with the patient so we will nurse was not empathetic very true she was not comforting the no, judgment that's true attender said also um, that the wife she is talking negatively yes I already you have uh, i have taken medicine still you are uh, you are having pain like that she is conveying okay so she is not uh, talking in a positive way yes true okay let's continue the class so there are some verbal do's and verbal don'ts as well as non verbal do's and non verbal don'ts don'ts let's see what it is so verbal do's are when we meet a patient greet the patient and fam family introduce yourself who you are what's your name so that the patient and the family will know who visited them or who is with them ascertain the identity of those person present to know the family members who are with the patient and how they are uh, how they are related to the patient all these we have to collect, collect through communication with them use open ended questions don't use leading or leading questions encourage the patient to speak we have to spend time with him encourage the patient to speak so that we can understand our patient and to understand their diagnosis as well as what they are suffering from then we have to repeat the important information that is paraphrasing back so that they the patient knows that we have been listening to them understanding them properly and we have listened to their what they are communicated to us use empathetic statements when appropriate there should be empathetic statement statements like oh it it happened like that what do you, oh. so the patient will, will be encouraged to talk, openly talk more with us use pauses when appropriate when we are rephrasing there should be pauses when where it is needed be honest about of, of information to be given if we are telling the patient any information we should have a truthful information that we should know what is the right information if there is a lack of you know we don't know we shouldn't tell any wrong and give any wrong information to the patient verbal dances avoid medic like earlier i said avoid medical jargons or vague trait most of the patients doesn't understand these medical terms that, that the commonly used in medical terms but use common like if they are saying that they have got cancer okay they will understand but if we say they are you are in the fourth stage of the cancer it's so and so or we are we are you are suffering from cervical so cervical cancer or something like that if we use medical jargons or we the patient will be confused and the communication there will be a barrier in communication um, avoid inappropriate humor we shouldn't laugh at them or sm smile when they are telling their sorrows or when they are narrating their past what they happened to them so we should avoid that in while we are communicating avoid ending the conversation suddenly that is what we talked earlier also avoid comparisons between patients do not give premature assurance or false assurance that you will get all right that so do uh, taking medicines you will get uh, you will be uh, getting well soon such re false reassurance should not be given to a patient do not ask leading questions non verbal do's uh, you should make i can't these are all we we have done it so we'll go faster into it i uh, we should have eye contact pleasant warm facial expression leaning forward respect the patient's need for personal space smile and touch use it carefully and appropriately 
at the right time and listen to the patient carefully. Nonverbal, do, do not stare at the patient, do not break into patient's comfort zone, avoid unwelcome facial expressions, avoid angry tone of voice, even if the patient displays indifference or anger or bad behavior towards us. Listen carefully, not passive, but actively. You should have an active listening skill while you are communicating, explore and use open questions. Factors helping active listening are nodding, reflecting back, that is rephrasing what the patient has told to us, leaning forward, paraphrasing. These are all helping in communicating. So uh, communication is key to successful relationship between a patient and a nurse or a doctor or a social worker. Active listening is key to successful communication. Talking more than necessary is a barrier to effective communication and effective listening. These, these are, these are called quotes. This is a director, Dr. M. R. Rajagoba, who says that it's easy to destroy somebody with a few words. It's also easy to lift somebody, a patient, up from the depths of their sorrow or suffering through good communications. Thank you. Thank you, Preeti, for the uh, wonderful session. Uh, anybody have any doubts regarding the session? Please ask her. If you want to share an experience or anything, you can share. So either you unmute yourself and talk, or uh, you can put your uh, questions in the chat box. Anybody? So, uh, if you uh, if you do, uh, Salome, uh, do you have questions? No. Okay. So now we understand that uh, the communication is one of the important tool for effective, that effective relationship. So without that, and also uh, we need to we understand that active listening is the key to uh, maintain a successful communication. So. Active listening is one of the important tools for uh, effective communication. Always you have to listen to the patient words uh, carefully. So time uh, you have to uh, take your own time to listen to their problems. Then only you can, uh, once you uh, have explored their problems, you can able to uh, give good suggestions and uh, you can able to help the patients. Uh, so you have to give a uh, good relationship with the patients and uh, maintain a uh, good communication skills towards the patients. So always remember uh, the do's and don'ts of the communications uh, while we communicating with the patient and the family. Uh, and uh, always uh, remember to uh, greet the patients and you have to do the self-introduction. So they uh, may not know who you are, you have to introduce yourself and uh, give a comfortable uh, that position to the patients and uh, ask open-ended questions. So then only uh, they will uh, start exploring their problems and uh, uh, sit down and listen to their problems. Uh, don't assume. So you have to believe the patient words and uh, whenever uh, necessary, you have to uh, you know, stop the conversation and clarify uh, their your uh, doubts with the patient so that uh, they can and uh, they can uh, think okay they they will 
listen carefully my uh, thing my problems and all so uh, that all things you have to um, uh, remember while doing communication okay uh, okay so reha raised one question if the patient not able to understand language uh, nurse keep the patient to make understanding and one one point nurse get frustrated is it good or bad communication um the problem is a patient can be comfortable only in their own native or in their talking language so we have to understand the language and if we have to understand the patient we have to know their language better but if a nurse is not able to understand if she gets frustrated then that connection between the a patient nurse relationship is broken at that moment the communication is broken the rapport building is broken and the patient will not have a good rapport with that patient and the patient will stop communicating with the nurse and if she behaves in a frustrated manner that means it's a good, it's a bad communication at that point and it will be a break and the barrier there will be a barrier in the communication between the patient and the nurse okay rega yeah Uh, sorry, there was a technical glitch. Um, so for that question, uh, if the patient is not understanding the language, what uh, the nurse is saying, and the nurse gets frustrated by that, um, there is a possibility, like uh, the nurse should give a chance to another person. Like uh, you don't want to continue that conversation because uh, already the patient is very frustrated with your uh, language barriers and the problem with communication. So it is not like, um, you don't have to continue that conversation uh, because the patient is already frustrated. And um, if you continue, it will affect the care for that patient. So what you have to do is just refer to any other persons in your um, uh, in your room or in your contact. And um, that would be uh, very um, good for that continuing care. So um, it's not a problem to uh, just uh, give your patient to another person uh, because the patient is getting uh, even good care with all that uh, nurses. So everyone is unique and uh, the language barriers are there. So you don't have to just blame yourself or getting frustrated. Just give the patient to next one. So it will continue, okay? Yes, uh, uh, Sharad. Uh, uh, told, uh, you, we have to find the find the person who is who knows that particular language and uh, refer the patient there and uh, make a good relationship with them and uh, for from there uh, we can get good uh, ideas about the patients. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we can uh, move on to the case presentation. Salome, uh, over to you. Are you sharing the? Yeah. Yes, we, we will. Yeah, so, hello to everyone. The, um, I'm Salome Berger. I'm from Switzerland and working as a nursing advisor in International Nepal Fellowship in the west of Nepal. So I'm the responsible for the, um, for different medical um, places, so hospitals from INF in the West. And my main working area um, is, is in the fistula, obstetric fistula center. And the case I'm presenting today it was, it came to the fistula center for obstetric fistula operation. So next slide. 
So the, um, this patient is 52 years old or approximately, usually patients here don't really know exactly their age. Um, she's female. Um, her diagnosis is COPD with congestive cardiac failure, CCF, and uh, she had COVID when she arrived, uh, and obstetric fistula since 20 years. Next slide. So um, when she arrived, she had shortness of breath, the cough, generalized edema, weakness, and urine incontinence. And so we had to uh, admit her straight, um, straight away into the, the COVID ICU. So next, yeah, so the, um, she had this obstetric fistula uh, since 20 years um, and acquired it during her second childbirth. Um, COPD also since many years, uh, but it got worse in the last two years. So she, uh, she was a smoker till she arrived in the hospital. The, and she had COVID infection and CCF and pneumonia on arrival. The, and we di diagnosed the hyperthyroidism uh, during her stay. Um, so her vital signs were pulse was 110, blood pressure 110, 100 to 60, temperature 103.5, the, um, the respiratory rate 28, and uh, the oxygen saturation of 56 to 75% without oxygen. The, her HP was normal, the um, total cell count was um, high with the 17,600. Urea was also high with 58. Creatinine and sodium was normal, but potassium was low with 2.9, and TSH was high. Then, yeah, as I said, she was admitted to the ICU straight at the beginning and stayed there for one, I think two weeks, and was then also admitted to the medical ward um, for her treatment. The, so she got oxygen the, um, and they treated her for her cardiac failure. She had chest physio, including spirometer exercise. The, um, so she's, the, because of her the condition, she wasn't smoking during the whole stay. Um, and we were also treating her hyperthyroidism. And when she was stabilized with COPD and with the CF, CCF, um, we then could perform the fistula operation. So Psychosocial aspects. So her first husband uh, went to India shortly after the birth of their daughter. After eight years without any contact, she married her current husband. When their first son was born dead, he married another woman. And while working in the India sometime later, he married yet another woman who left him after a short time. Because he had no children from the other wives, he still lives with the patient. So she has three daughters who are all married and live with their respective husbands. So the two sons that she had uh, died, one at birth and one with two years old. Then she was living in social isolation for the last 20 years because of her fistula and urine incontinence. So she doesn't really have friends. Uh, she is Hindu, and, but can't go to, to a temple or to um, any uh, any activities because she's considered unclean. Um, also, social activities in the village are uh, not possible, were not possible for her so far. They are substenance, substenance farmers. Uh, they have no other income. Her husband is too old now to go to somewhere else for work. So uh, they are just at home. The, and the, their relatives, their daughters, they, they don't have any 
possibility to actually support them. Once they went to India uh, together for fistula treatment, but they couldn't afford it. And so she was then living several more years with fistula. So the current medications, they are, are salmetrol and fluticasone inhaler, BD, theotropium inhaler, OD, prusamide 20 milligram OD, nitrofurantin, the 100 mg, the TDS, thyronorm 50 milligrams OD, vitamin B and C OD, omeprazole 20 milligrams BD, and oxybutynin in five milligrams BD for her bladder function. So main concerns, uh, so the oxygen uh, saturation came up with all the exercises and treatment. So actually now it's not 83, it's actually um, around 87 to 92 without oxygen. But we, we think because she had the, her COPD for a long time, that she is used to a lower oxygen level. So the, we are not giving any oxygen anymore. Then uh, another concern is when she goes home in two days, um, will she be able to actually refrain from smoking? She knows all the advantages and is um, doing well without. But when she comes in the same, into the same setting at home, what will happen? The, and then also the continuation of medication at home because of their financial problems and also the distance to the next health post. And another point which I haven't put here was, is also that her bladder is very small. So her fistula is healed, but because of her small bladder, she has to go to toilet very frequently. Um, we hope that this improves over time, but this also will uh, restrain her for, from uh, longer social interactions. Yeah, so the summary is the 52 years old woman with COPD and a saturation level of, yeah, so 87 to 92% without oxygen. So the, the discussion points, do we need to provide palliative care for this patient? What are the problems faced by this patient? And how can we support this patient at home to prevent rehospitalization? Thank you. Thank you, Salome, for the excellent presentation. Uh, anybody need any more clarification regarding this patient's story, please ask her. Otherwise, we can move on to the discussion points. Anybody need any more clarification? Like I do have a query here. Like the patient was uh, on COPD and she was taking, as you have told the medications for so long. So after taking uh, steroids for such a long, was uh, she not having any other uh, pain symptoms also apart from these? Pain? No, she's not complaining of any pain. So she had pain before, but um, that's not the case currently. Okay, thank you. Okay. I hope uh, this presentation is clear to everyone. So we can move on to the discussion points. Uh, do we need, the first question is, do we need to provide palliative care for these patients? So what is your answer? No. Sonia said yes. Why you say yes? Please unmute yourself and talk. Yes, because this is the uh, disease, COPD is the disease for which there is no complete cure. So in my view, it's yes. Okay, thank you.
So, uh, Vishaka said uh, she was in isolation since many years. So now, uh, definitely, uh, this patient need uh, palliative care because uh, she need a physical uh, care. She need an emotional uh, part. She we need to cover the four aspects of uh, management. So uh, she we need to give her physical management, uh, psychological management, social management, and the spiritual management. She has some spiritual issues also. So we need to cover the uh, four aspects. Okay. As we learn palliative care, palliative care is uh, um, the, uh, for a total uh, patient care. So we have to address all uh, those problems. So then only we can improve the quality of life of the patient and their family. Okay. So uh, now we move on to the uh, problems faced by the patient. So uh, how will we uh, identify the problems? She was having breathing difficulty, so because of that, uh, that can be found using the saturation. It has been told. She was having a generalized edema also. And, uh, because of urine incontinence, she might have uh, ulcers as well. Okay. Thank you. So she has some physical problems and also she has uh, some isolation as uh, she uh, has isolated many years. So how will we find out uh, whether the patient is having any uh, social isolation or family isolation? Please uh, put your answers in the chat box. So if the patient is having uh, fi family isolation or a social isolation there, how will we find out? Okay, so how will we find out? Actually, the answers are given in the chat box. Uh, interview technique by talking to parents, patient verbalize by ta by taking means talking to the patient by communicate with her. Yes, the exact answer is there by C. R. Rajput. Communication. So that's why uh, a communication session or uh, a communication is exactly needed. Uh, otherwise, the patient doesn't know about the exact diagnosis, the prognosis, or what are the problems she's having, like physical, uh, social, or socio-economical, or spiritual, or psychological problems. What are they facing? So these kind of problems can be identified only through a proper communication only. Uh, so in this case, uh, we can know about, uh, with the story, uh, what are the problems she's facing. Uh, with the presentation, I think Salami did a good job. Um, she communicated everything with us. And through her, we can know about what are the problems she is facing right now. So we can uh, just uh, categorize it with the four type of management, like uh, what should be done at first. It will be coming to physical needs at first. And the second priority should be given to the psychological and socioeconomical aspects. Then only we can lead to uh, the spiritual aspects. So uh, with proper communication, we can have a solution, not a proper solution. We can just manage it uh, to an extent. So that is why palliative care is exactly needed. Um, okay. Okay, uh, so moving on to the third one, I think, uh, how can we support this patient? Can we support this patient at home to prevent rehospitalization? Um, when you compare it with uh, uh, Palim India, uh, what we suggest is a home care service. Uh, at first, we can just diagnose the patient, means we can uh, get the treatment 
and uh, with a home visit by seeing them personally with the help of a doctor and a social worker and nurses with proper care, that is a start. Then only we can just go to uh, the direction where uh, it needed to be directed. Like um, with a proper home visit and giving them the actual treatment what they needed, we can just stop or prevent the rehospitalization. For for that to happen, uh, I will suggest a home visit at first. Before that, if they are not able to, uh, like uh, if we are not able to do that at first, we should call them at first. Then we should just uh, assess the situations there and how they are living in and what is their exact conditions. Uh, does the patient is living alone right now or she's having any support from the family members or who is taking care of her. So that kind of things needs to be assessed. After the basic assessment with the proper communication only, we can just move on to further treatment or further uh, procedures only. Uh, so to prevent rehospitalization, we need proper care and that should be done. Yes. And after that, we need continuous follow up. Uh, thank you, Sharad, uh, for the clarification. Uh, so, uh, if uh, what way we can able to prevent rehospitalization? That is the good question. So we can able to. Uh, uh, if, Salome, uh, I have a question. Uh, does she uh, staying alone or uh, some family members? So she is staying with her husband. Uh, they have their own little house. Uh, okay. I don't know about the condition of this house, but um, they are living together. But no one else with them. Okay. So her husband is staying with her, right? Yes. So uh, do one thing: if uh, her husband is willing to take care of her, you can you can uh, teach the husband uh, about the patient's care within the hospital. So we have to demonstrate how to enable is how to uh, take care of that patient. What all that all things we need to uh, give a good uh, that instruction to the uh, husband, and then we can. Uh, send back to her home and do the for home care follow. If you have a home care set up there, you can do the home care uh, things uh, there. So that time, uh, that the patients feel more comfortable than the hospital. She feel, uh, within the home, she feel more comfortable. If possible, you can provide uh, home care uh, after educating the husband. So that is the key. Uh, in front of you, uh, we all the nurses. Uh, know how to take care of the patients, how to do the nebulization, how to uh, give medications and all. So you have to give a proper uh, instructions. Uh, whenever you in giving care, you have to accompany with him uh, throughout the patient care, and then you can uh, prepare the prepare him for uh, effective management. Then you can send them back. Uh, anybody have any other comments on that? Uh, Salome, do you have home care settings there? No, so we are not a palliative care center. We are the, we are fistula center, and we the, but we have some income generation the projects, and our outreach workers are also going for home home visits if needed. Okay. So uh, I think. For this patient, we are also planning to have a home visit to assess if we can provide some um, income generation uh, help for them. Okay, thank you. So that is good. Uh, and also, if you don't have a home care uh, uh, settings there, you can connect an NGO or maybe uh, that if, they, if the other NGOs contacting a home care, you can connect with them. Yeah, so the problem here in the west of Nepal, it's so underdeveloped, uh, it, it's not uh, very much available. But we hope to set up palliative care from next year on slowly. Um, I hope this will then improve. 
so and the another thing is uh, if you don't have a home care setting so you can the, conduct a telemedicine so uh, if you have a set telemedicine if they have a problem there they can uh, call uh, you and uh, make a video call and uh, that uh, seeing their problems and you can advise through phone telecommunication would be preferable Okay, thank you. So, time up. Uh, we can wind up the session. Uh, thank you, Preeti, uh, for the wonderful session. Thank you, Salome, for the wonderful case presentation. We have learned a lot, especially on communication, what are the do's, don'ts, and uh, what are the active listening is important. Uh, important. This is maintaining effective communication. That all things we uh, learned today. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, thank you. See you on Thursday. Thank you everyone for joining us. I believe that uh, good communications definitely need better results for professionals like you in the coming days. So uh, with that note, this is Sri Priya along with his sister Shiba and Miss Preeti and Mr. Sharad signing off from the Tips Eco Hub. See you in the next session. Take care. Bye-bye.